Thank you very much. The next item of business today is portfolio questions. And we'll start with question number one from Emma Harper. Oh, yes. Question number one from Emma Harper, if we can... Have you got your card in, Emma? Yes. There we are. Thank you. Um, to ask the Scottish Government to provide an update on its work to protect the marine environment. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. The Scottish Government has made considerable progress in its work to protect the marine environment. The National Marine Plan was adopted in March 2015 and provides a framework for consistent decision making that takes account of the marine environment. Work is now progressing to implement marine planning at a regional scale. Marine protected areas provide additional protection to important locations in our seas. This network now covers around 20% of our marine area. Work to complete the network and deliver necessary and appropriate management measures will continue over the next couple of years. Emma Harper. Thank you for your answer. Uh, coastal communities have always relied on the sea for their livelihoods. What is being done to ensure efforts to protect the marine environment take into account the needs of our coastal communities and eliminate illegal activity which affects the fishing industry? Cabinet Secretary. Well, all of the work to improve the protection of the marine environment has been underpinned by stakeholder engagement and robust management. And the stakeholder engagement has been undertaken at all levels from national and regional stakeholder workshops, meetings with marine industries, environmental NGOs, community groups and consultation events in towns and villages around the coast. And the decisions made by the Scottish Government to protect the marine environment are based on scientific evidence and take proper account of the wide range of views received in response to public consultations. The current work to devolve the management of the Crown Estate to roll out regional marine planning and to complete the MPA network will ensure that local communities continue to have every opportunity to have their say. Enforcement resources are deployed in Scottish waters using a risk-based intelligence-led system to ensure that illegal activity is deterred or detected. Finlay Carson. Thank you, President Officer. Given that Marine Scotland see a uh, protection of electrofishing uh, as a priority. Would the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that it's very concerning that there's only been one conviction in the last three years for illegal electrofishing in Galloway and Western Fries? And would the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that uh, to ensure that the razor clam beds are protected, we should now see an all-out ban on this illegal activity? Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, electrofishing for razor clams uh, that takes place now is illegal. Um, the government has sought views in a consultation about whether electrofishing for razor clams should be made legal. So there's currently a, con uh, a consultation ongoing. Uh, uh, well, it, it closed on 30th of September and the responses will be uh, published. Our response will be published soon. We did consult about the issue because of some recent scientific evidence that suggested um, that electrofishing could be a low impact method of harvesting, harvesting razor clams. So it turns out not to be just quite as straightforward uh, as we might have assumed. The prohibition is in EU law. Um, and obviously, if there were any steps to be taken to uh, approve it, there would have to be a considerable amount of work done around management arrangements, etc. Um, I'm happy to deal uh, directly with the member on this very particular issue, if he so wishes. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, the regional planning uh, is, uh, is, of course, essential, but so far, as the Cabinet Secretary knows, there are uh, just the two regional planning partnerships as pilots in operation. Can the Cabinet <coughs> Secretary how the say how the government is working with local authorities to get other planning partnerships up and running and make sure that they have the resource and the expertise necessary to take this important initiative forward? Uh, well, I've just signed a number of letters today in respect of the Clyde uh, um, uh, Marine Plan. Um, the, the two that are being progressed in Clyde and in Shetland, uh, I think it's very important. We, we've chosen two very deliberately to be quite different so that we can explore some of the issues around how they are to be managed. Um, and I think it's quite important that we take this steadily, um, that they're not all going to happen in a very short space of time. The rollout of regional plans will take a number of years um, uh, and I would hope the member would have patience in respect of that 
uh, because we have to ensure that what we are doing actually works into the longer term. So there are no immediate plans for a third or a fourth, but that's because the first and the second have really got to be worked out carefully before we move on to more. Question two has not been lodged. Question three, Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to amend the Protection of Wild Animals Scotland Act 2002 in light of the review by Lord Bonamy. Cabinet Secretary. Um, I'm aware that the member takes a keen interest in animal welfare issues. We are considering the Right Honourable Lord Bonamy's findings carefully and will respond early next year. Any proposals for legislative change will be subject to the proper consultation processes. Colin Smith. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Earlier this month, Dumfries and Galloway Standard reported on a horrific case where a Dumfries resident, Daniel Sobolitz, was looking out of his back door at a fox in a neighbouring field. The fox began running towards him, but before it got to him, a pack of dogs grabbed the fox, shook it around and left it for dead. It's clear that hunting and killing foxes with packs still takes place in Scotland. So will the Cabinet Secretary give an assurance that in any future consultation, the Government will not only consider the very welcome recommendations from Lord Bonamy's review in relation to, for example, extended time limits for prosecution, but will also consider further amendments to legislation that would remove the flushing to gun exemption and reduce the number of dogs used in all exemptions to two. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I am aware of the specific incident that the member uh, raises. Um, the Protection of Wild Mammals Scotland Act does make it an offence to deliberately hunt a wild mammal with a dog. Um, however, there is still some need for vermin control uh, and there have to be available ways in which that happens. Um, in terms of what we choose to do, uh, Lord Bonamy has given us a very detailed outline of what he considers may need to be measures taken uh, into account. Um, I've indicated that we're going to respond to that formally uh, in January and if that requires primary legislation in any way, shape or form, well, obviously there will be further consultation. But in any case, we would come back to discuss uh, any uh, response that we had. And I would confidently expect that the member will want to be part of that process. Question four, Rhoda Grant. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to tackle air pollution. Cabinet Secretary. The Cleaner Air for Scotland strategy sets out a series of actions for Government, Transport Scotland, local authorities and others to further reduce air pollution across Scotland. Financial and other support is provided to local authorities to assist them with monitoring and implementing local actions to improve air quality. The recent budget identified an additional £1 million to support this priority work. Rhoda Grant. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Um, she'll be aware that we've made quite a lot of progress in cutting carbon em emissions with electricity, but we have made very little progress in cutting carbon emissions from cars and from transport more generally. Um, what infrastructure is required to make a step change here? For instance, do we need more car charging points or do we need incentives for people to clean up their vehicles? Cabinet Secretary. Well, there is quite a lot of activity goes on uh, at local authority level, particularly because they are primarily uh, the uh, organisation which will be dealing with uh, local air quality management issues. Uh, I'm sure the member has noticed the Transport Minister sitting next to me, um, uh, and it may be that he has uh, particularly specific things that he would want to contribute to this, but we do work very closely with Transport Scotland, uh, and there are some... Uh, uh, ongoing discussions at the moment about the future of any low emission zone or zones that might be introduced uh, in Scotland. But again, that would be in partnership with local government, uh, as it would always have to be. Um, and uh, uh, I would um, hope uh, that we will be able to fulfil the manifesto commitment to have that by, what was it, 2018? 2018, 2018 uh, in place. Um, uh, but that is best done, I think, on a more local level, because at local level there will be requirements for different kinds of uh, uh, management uh, for it to work ideally, um, rather than trying to make it across the whole of Scotland. Joan McAlpine. Um, thank you. Can the Cabinet Secretary give any detail on how air pollution in Scotland compares to air pollution in the rest of the UK and Europe? Cabinet Secretary. Well, air quality in Scotland compares relatively well with the rest of the UK and Europe. Um, we're compliant with EU requirements in fine particulate matter, 
other than some issues around Hope Street in Glasgow. Um, this compares uh, with the situation Paris and other French cities, for example, experience where emergency measures have been introduced as a result of their levels. Uh, and such situations are often replicated in other cities, especially in Central and Southern Europe. Um, the monitor in Glasgow is intended only to measure the worst case scenario and isn't representative of normal public exposure. So both in general terms and in particular terms, um, we seem to be doing relatively well in comparison with the rest of Europe. Question number five, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how its proposed new climate change targets will take account of the Paris Agreement goal of pursuing efforts to limit temperature increase to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government's forthcoming climate change bill will reflect the increased global ambition of the Paris Agreement by setting new statutory greenhouse gas emission reduction targets, including a more testing 2020 target. The Scottish Government's approach to climate change targets is based on the best available evidence, and it has commissioned independent advice from the Committee on Climate Change on the appropriate level, uh, levels, forms, and mechanisms uh, for targets in the bill. The Committee has issued a call for evidence in relation to its advice, which will remain open until 1st February 2017. Patrick Harvey. Thank you. Even before the Paris Agreement raised the level of global ambition on limiting temperature increase, it was already clear that the bulk of the world's fossil fuels are unburnable. We have far more existing reserves of fossil fuels than we can afford to burn, even if to, to restrain warming to two degrees. Given that increased ambition, uh, that, that proportion of burnable fossil fuels is going to reduce even further. Isn't, it, uh, a, isn't there a strong case that the climate change legislation should not only have direct emission reduction targets, but also place clear limits on the extraction of fossil fuels, because that's what's going to have to come to an end if we have the remotest chance of achieving this 1.5 degree goal? As I indicated, we are uh, waiting advice from the Committee on Climate Change in respect of the Climate Change Bill, uh, which has not been introduced into Parliament yet and which is still a, a matter of considerable discussion. And I hear what the Member is saying and I will uh, ensure that his, uh, his views uh, are reflected in any of the discussions that we have. I should add, uh, Presiding Officer, that Scotland is a member of the Under 2 MOU Coalition, which covers over a billion people uh, uh, around the world, uh, in states and regions. Um, and as a signatory, a signatory to that coalition, we recognise that global ambition must be increased to meet the Paris Agreement goals. Uh, and just for uh, additional advice, uh, I want to quote the First Minister at the Arctic Circle Assembly, uh, where she said, it is essential that the world meets the overall target we set ourselves in Paris of limiting global temperature increases to well below two degrees Celsius and making serious efforts to keep them below 1.5 degrees. So I hope the member um, is happy with that uh, statement of intent. David Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The Paris Agreement will require complex and detailed planning to meet the 2020 and 2050 targets. How important is the Times accounting model as a tool in achieving the future climate change targets? Mr. Secretary. Thank the member for raising that. The Times model, for those who are not familiar with it is a, um, a relatively recent innovation um, that is being used within Scottish Government uh, which has made uh, working out the proposals that need to be in the climate change plan this time around um, rather more straightforward than they were the last time we had to do this because it is a model that allows us to feed in scenarios and get out from that a clear indication of what will be the result uh, of those scenarios. So um, that is going to be a vital tool uh, as we move forward through the climate change plan, which of course has still got to be laid before Parliament, and then in the climate change bill when we come to setting uh, much tougher targets for ourselves. The Times model will give us clarity uh, on what will be achieved when we take certain actions. Julian Martin. I must first declare that I'm the Parliamentary Liaison Officer to the Cabinet Secretary. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that Scotland is a world leader in tackling climate change, with our ambitious targets and success in meeting our 2020 target six years early? And it's important that we continue to show the international community that significant emissions reductions are deliverable. Cabinet Secretary. Um, 
Presiding officer, what's interesting when you leave Scotland to have a conversation about climate change is the extent to which people do recognise, are cognisant of uh, the advances that have been made here. Um, and uh, even the environmental NGOs who uh, delight in tweaking our tails in Scotland will nevertheless go out of Scotland and uh, boast quite widely uh, of the successes uh, that have been achieved. So I do agree uh, with that, but it is worth saying that we are recognised uh, outside Scotland for the work that we have done. It's important that we don't always simply look uh, inside, uh, uh, but also consider that there is validation coming from elsewhere. And I met Patricia Espinoza, head of UN climate body, uh, who uh, I met her at the climate change talks in Morocco, and she called Scotland meeting its 2020 target six years early a great achievement. And I can advise that the climate group uh, were uh, extremely interested in what we had done because we were making great advances uh, and they hope to use our example um, to encourage other states and regions to achieve the same. So I think it's quite right that we understand and recognise that we do have international validation for what we do and it is recognised uh, as being world leading. Question number six, Annie Weld. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it, will it is taking to monitor and improve air quality in Glasgow. Cabinet Secretary. Under the Environment Act 1995 and associated regulations, all Scottish local authorities are required to regularly review air quality in their areas against objectives for several pollutants of particular concern for human health. Glasgow City Council has produced an air quality action plan containing a comprehensive range of measures to improve air quality in the city. The Scottish Government is working closely with the Council as it implements the measures contained in the plan and is providing practical and financial assistance to both monitor air quality and support delivery of measures. Annie Wells. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Data from the World Health Organisation puts Glasgow among 11 urban areas in the UK and Ireland, regularly exceeding safe levels of air pollution. Given that this is bad not only for people's health but also the wider environment, what action will the Scottish Government take to encourage more people to choose greener ways to travel? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I think this government uh, is, uh, is making uh, considerable progress in persuading people that uh, uh, use of public transport is a smarter option in many cases than the, the private car use. But if they want to use private cars, there's obviously uh, a growing uh, option of electric vehicles with a much widening uh, uh, range of charging points. Uh, and the potentially exciting uh, innovation that may come from hydrogen. Um, so all of those uh, are, uh, are, are things which are, are there and that we want to encourage everybody uh, to take up if possible. The, the member will have heard some of the comments I made about Glasgow earlier that may also pertain to what she's saying. But can I just pick up on the one thing that she said, which I think is very important, and that is understanding and accepting the massive health impact that poor air quality has. It is an extraordinary uh, issue of human health, and I think it's one that we need to take much more seriously in that regard, as well as its environmental impacts. Question number seven, Ian Gray. <clears throat> to ask the Scottish Government how it will compensate for the reported uh, 60,000 tonnes of additional emissions that could be caused by it introducing a 50% reduction in air passenger duty. Our plan to cut air departure tax by 50% by the end of the Parliament and then abolish it when public finances permit is a key to improving Scotland's international connectivity. Uh, and we think that's in particularly important in light of the economic uncertainty caused by the outcome of the EU referendum. Our approach will be taken forward in the context of the Scottish Government's overall approach to reducing emissions. The Committee on Climate Change's most recent report on Scotland's progress towards meeting the targets advised that any increase in emissions from reducing the tax is likely to be manageable. We will also consult on how a 50% reduction could be delivered as part of the strategic environmental assessment process. Ian Gray. <clears throat> but in those overall plans, the Cabinet Secretary must understand that air travel is responsible for 13% of Scotland's transport emissions. It is the highest emitter of carbon dioxide per passenger kilometre of any form of transport. Uh, and it is the only sector where emissions have risen significantly over the past 20 years. Can the Cabinet Secretary not see that our government's plans to abolish APD, drive a coach and horses, or perhaps fly a jumbo jet 
through her government's credibility on climate change? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the short answer to that is that I would suggest the member take it up directly with the Committee on Climate Change, which is where we get our advice. They have advised us this is manageable across all of government emissions, and we have chosen to do this uh, uh, because we do believe there are significant economic benefits to be gotten from the process. Angus MacDonald. Um, the Cabinet Secretary mentioned the UK Committee on Climate Change. What's her view on um, their uh, statement that uh, due to the international nature of the industry, future policy approaches to aviation emissions should be at the global or EU level. Cabinet Secretary. Well, indeed, many of the key levers are at this level, so we do support the committee's call for international policy approaches to aviation emissions. Recognising the importance of such emissions, we're also showing global leadership by including them in our domestic targets. Murder Fraser. Um, would the Cabinet Secretary agree that uh, there are fewer environmental concerns if we decide to reduce air passenger duty on long-haul flights only, because then we will not see the prospect of modal shift from surface travel to uh, short-haul flights? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as with uh, um, the response to Ian Gray, um, I, I need to advise the member, as I have done on a number of occasions in respect of climate change, that we take advice from the Committee on Climate Change um, that they have given us a general answer in respect of emissions, how those emissions uh, in, uh, uh, in connection with the reduction in air passenger duty are comprised is a matter uh, that we will uh, make a decision on in discussion with others. I hear what the member is having to say, but if he thinks I'm going to stand here and endorse Conservative Party policy without further consultation, he's very wrong. <laughs> it's Christmas. <laughs> And that concludes our questions <laughs> on the environment, I'm afraid. We move on to rural economy and connectivity. Question number one, Alex Cole-Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what is being done to provide access to fibre broadband in areas where there is an insufficiency of hardware to meet demand. Cabinet Secretary Fergus Ewing. The Scottish Government and our partners are investing over £400 million in the Digital Scotland Superfast Broadband Programme to expand, extend fibre broadband access to at least 95% of homes and businesses across Scotland by the end of 2017. The Digital Scotland programme has given around 679,000 homes and businesses access to fibre broadband, over 90% of which are capable of receiving superfast speeds. This uh, programme is delivering new fibre infrastructure in areas where the market would not otherwise have reached. Where demand exceeds capacity in an area connected by the Digital Scotland Superfast Broadband programme, extra equipment can be added to the existing fibre cabinets or a new larger capacity cabinet built to ensure everyone can connect to fibre. Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The village of Kirk Liston is a beautiful and welcoming community just eight miles from this chamber. Its citizens pay Edinburgh City Council tax rates and Edinburgh property prices, but they're often overlooked in terms of things like affordable public transport links and even two weeks ago, up until two weeks ago, Christmas lights. On five occasions in the past four years, residents have been told to ready themselves for the arrival of fibre optic broadband, uh, only to be thwarted for a range of reasons around hardware and cabling connections to the nearest exchange. This summer, to a frisson of excitement, some streets did start receiving faster broadband, but again, due to hardware issues, this is stalled with many homes making do with near dial-up speeds of two megabytes per second, 90% less than the city average. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise my, my constituents in Kirkliston when they can expect to be fully connected and how he plans to work with Digital Scotland to better manage expectations for fibre optic rollout? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I'm pleased to note that at the end of quarter one of 2016-17 in Mr Cole Hamilton's constituency, around 3,300 premises have been connected to the fibre network, with at least 3,200 premises able to achieve superfast speeds. And his constituency is in the City of Edinburgh, a local authority area. At the end of the same quarter, around 12,500 premises have been connected to the fibre network by the Digital Scotland programme, providing 92.7% coverage, with at least 91% 0.7% capable of receiving superfast speeds. Uh, if Mr Cole Hamilton had given me notice beforehand about Kirk Liston, of course I would have specifically looked at that. Uh, I'm happy to do so if he wishes to write to me, but I'm proud of the fact that uh, because of our £400 million programme, we are proceeding 
towards uh, 95 percent coverage uh, by the end of next year and 679,000 homes have already been connected. Had we not had this program, it wouldn't have been 95 percent, it would have been 66 percent. So I just put these facts into the equation. Stuart McMillan. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, would the Cabinet Secretary consider amending procurement regulations to ensure that there should be a presumption to install broadband connectivity when any new buildings, either fully or part funded by public money, are being constructed? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we have been uh, working in respect of digital technology on the aspect of enabling the rollout of uh, uh, technology as swiftly as possible, particularly, more particularly in relation uh, to permitted development rights for mobile telephony and for mobile mass, something which many local authorities are lobby us for, uh, not least in my own part of Scotland. So I think, uh, I think it's a very sensible point that uh, Mr McMillan has made, and I'm happy to look into it as a positive contribution to the debate. Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the point that Mr Cole Hamilton makes is a very pertinent one. People living in urban areas and towns and even cities uh, such as co-winning in my region, are equally frustrated that whilst fibre has been delivered to local cabinet, there are many who still cannot access high-speed internet. For the record, could I ask the cabinet secretary if he can confirm that every residential or commercial premise who is currently unable to access high-speed broadband has not been counted in the current success statistics, and will he guarantee that every one of them will have access by the end of the term of this parliament? Cabinet secretary. Um, well, I, I can tell the member, and he should know this because he's heard this before, as of many other members, that there is an audit process that's carried out quarterly, and it audits and analyses the, uh, the performance under the contract. Now, the figure of 679,000, uh, which I mentioned to the member on the committee this morning, uh, so he's well aware of it, is not yet audited, but uh, once it has been uh, audited, then we will be able to say that we are extremely well advanced in our way to meeting our targets. But it's not only that, presiding officer. I mean, although the Conservatives don't like to hear it, Audit Scotland, in their independent report, have already said that we are well on track to meeting the performance under our contract. And if he's not interested in that, Ofcom, the independent regulator, the UK regulator, has said that Scotland is making faster progress than the rest of the UK. Now, I will not be satisfied until we have got the universal coverage that is in our manifesto. But surely, presiding officer, at this time of the year, we can expect a little bit more from what's supposed to be the main opposition than unremitting negativity. Uh, Rhoda Grant. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, the cabinet secretary will be aware that people living in rural areas are often at some distance away from fibre. And can I ask what t other technologies will be used in those areas that will be future-proofed and also provide high speeds? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, well, I think that's a more sensible question, if I may say so, presiding officer. And I think Rhoda Grant, is, as she raised on the committee this morning, is quite right in saying, uh, uh, is quite right in saying that, uh, that we need to examine different approaches for different solutions for different parts of Scotland. Community broadband is working in 77 projects, for example. There is a special project being developed by BT in the Western Isles to provide better coverage. So there's a variety of different technologies and we are open to working with any member that wants to contribute in a positive fashion. Question number two, Claudia Bewish. Thank you, presiding officer. Uh, to ask Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the IT system for common agricultural policy payments. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. During my statement to members on the 13th of September, I committed to reporting back to Parliament uh, in January 2017 on the progress made. Sorry, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, more specifically, in 2017, the Scottish Government will need to deliver the balanced payments for the loan scheme as well as the remaining balance for the coupled beef and sheep schemes and the vital less favoured area support scheme. No timeline, as I understand it, has been provided for delivery of these payments. So can the Cabinet Secretary clarify when these payments of balance will begin and when they will be completed? Cabinet Secretary. Hey, well, the, the member refers to the national scheme, the, the loan scheme, and she's right to say that that, that has uh, uh, been introduced. And my understanding is that nearly 13,000 farmers have chosen to avail themselves of that scheme. 
and that has injected £260 million into the rural economy uh, in the, around the first fortnight in November. So that's a good thing, and I think most farmers, at least outside this chamber, have uh, welcomed that. So far as, uh, so far as the... Uh, uh, so far as the specific point that she makes is, uh, is concerned, I met with the chief executive of CGI, the contractors, just last week, uh, and obviously we are pressing for timeless delivery of all payments by the deadline next year, which is June, and in respect of the loan payments, we expect to have repaid the financial transactions element of which finance the loan repayments uh, uh, by the end of this financial year or thereabouts. Peter Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I refer members to my register of interest. <laughs> <laughs> the Cabinet Secretary will be aware that there have been significant issues relating to transferring entitlements, with many farmers unable to receive payment for many, many months. Can he confirm by what date the IT system will be able to process entitlement transfers? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I, I, obviously there are a great many different cases and they're all triggered at different times because, you know, farms aren't sold on the 1st of January, they're uh, sold or transferred throughout the year. So there's no cohort called uh, transfer of entitlements which fall to be dealt with on any particular date. Uh, I mean, it would be ludicrous to suggest that that's the case. But in the spirit of Christmas, I'm very happy to write to the, to the member uh, to confirm that we, will, we shall be obviously tacking all these payments uh, as swiftly as we possibly can. It is a serious uh, issue for those farmers who have transferred of entitlements. There are complexities involved, as the member knows, but we all want to ensure that uh, these matters uh, are processed as quickly as possible. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, I draw members' uh, attention to my registered agricultural holding of a massive three acres. Uh, what measures are being uh, taken to address costs of uh, the CAP futures system uh, and to ensure that CAP payments are put on a better footing in future? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, can I reply to the small holder uh, by, <laughs> by stating that we have been working hard to bear down on the costs of the CAP futures system. And from November, we expect to see savings of uh, over 10% on the costs of the contractors with the supplier taking the risk on delivery of these savings. In addition to that, presiding officer, as a result of the negotiations which I've overseen with the contractor, there will be a new penalty and service credit regime in place that will incentivize timely delivery and impose financial penalties where those timetables are not met. So I hope that that commercial discipline uh, will help us uh, deliver eff efficaciously our obligations in respect of the CAP system. Question number three, Graham Day. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how it will improve access to rail for residents of Moray Faith. Minister Hamza Yusuf. Since the introduction uh, of additional Scottish Rail services between Moray Faith and Dundee in 2013, the number of passengers using Moray Faith has more than doubled. I'm pleased to confirm that plans are currently being developed by Scott Rail to further enhance the service by the end of 2018. This will improve rail connections for the residents of Moni Feath and indeed the wider region. The Scottish Government is committed to enhancing rail services and connectivity and the success at Moni Feath is being replicated across Scotland. Graham Day. Thank the Minister for that answer. Um, he, he's absolutely right to point that out. There was an increase of 42% immediately after the introduction of additional services in 2013. And, uh, sorry, an 88% increase and a 42% increase since then. However, all told, there are still only seven trains a day maximum serving Moray Feath. Can I ask whether there might be any scope to further meet the clearly evidenced demand for rail access in the town ahead of that very welcome introduction of the hourly coastal service in mid to late 2018? Minister. Uh, yes, and, and the member is right to point out, of course, that Moni Feath uh, is certainly in our plans as part of our investment in the revolution uh, in rail. He is right again to point out the increase in passenger numbers uh, using uh, that uh, station. And again, uh, as I reiterate, there are plans being developed uh, towards the end of 2018. But uh, yes, certainly I will take that back and flag with Scott Rail uh, for consideration if anything can be done 
before then, I would just uh, caveat that by saying it can be extremely difficult. He knows, uh, you know, additional carriages or indeed additional services at one station or one particular service usually mean the diminution of services uh, indeed at others, unless we can find more rolling stock, which ScotRail are actively uh, looking to do. So I'll certainly take that back to ScotRail, and of course I'll update the member uh, with that update. <coughs> Question number four, Neil Findlay. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on whether Scotland has good bus services. Minister. Yes, but clearly uh, room uh, for uh, improvement. The most important opinion, of course, on the quality of the bus service comes from the passenger. The most recent bus passenger, service, uh, passenger survey reflects an increase over the last three years of passenger satisfaction. The survey and the work of bus users Scotland helps us to understand how services are perceived by customers and, of course, importantly, identify areas for improvement which we are committed to doing. If the Minister Neil believes Finley. we have good bus services, then I don't know what planet he is living on. Bus services across many areas, areas of Scotland are diabolical, absolutely diabolical. And in many areas, services just do not exist. So how on earth did we end up uh, with a nine million underspend in last year's budget? What I would say is that the decline in bus patronage is something that's been happening, in fact, since the 1960s. In fact, between the 1960s and 1985, it uh, was the steepest uh, decline when buses, in fact, uh, were regulated. And I would point out to the member that the worst decline has been in Glasgow and the west of Scotland, where, of course, uh, local authorities have been in charge for many years. But he's right to say that, of course, the situation is not where we want it to be. And because of that, he will have noticed from Derek Mackay, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance's uh, budget statement uh, just last week, that the bus service operators grant has increased from 50 million uh, with an additional uh, few million uh, as we currently stand. So discussions are taking place with the bus operators about how we can improve services. So I wouldn't call it diabolical. I, mean, I know uh, uh, he has some issues and we have some differences. What I would say to the member in the spirit of Christmas and reaching out to people is that we have a transport bill that we have committed to as a government. There will be a bus element uh, to that. There's clearly differences between him and, and I uh, about the approach, but if he comes with considered proposals and his party comes with considered proposals, I would want them to be part of the solution about how we can work together to improve and reverse, of course, that decline in bus patronage. Liam Kerr. The Minister flagged to Graham Day, in the northeast of Scotland, good and reliable rail services are as valuable and important as good bus services. So would the Minister agree that it's very disappointing that, according to the annual efficiency and finance assessment of Network Rail, there has been a slower than expected progress on the Aberdeen to Inverness journey time improvement project? And, given the AWPR delays and that the Air Aberdeen Airport receives less funding than any Scottish airport, can we conclude the Scottish Government pays only lip service to improving connectivity in the northeast of Scotland? Minister. Oh, the Christmas Grinch has arrived, uh, most certainly, presiding officer. Uh, AWPR, significant investment, dueling of the A9, dueling of the A96. Uh, of course, the investment that we promised for the Hodigan roundabout improvements. Lawrence Kirk Junction being delivered by this government, of course, when other governments uh, refused to do so. We've got a great record in the northeast. And I look forward to continued investment in the North East. And I would say to the member, uh, come on, uh, don't be the Christmas Grinch. It is the time for a good festive spirit. Be generous in your considerations. Where there are delays, where there can be improvements to be made, uh, of course, we'll work with local partners, as we have done with Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire Council as part, uh, of course, of the funding that we're providing to improve rail services and transport services. There will be a £5 million appraisal if he wants to come forward, a transport appraisal if he wants to come forward with considered and costed proposals, they will be part of that appraisal consideration. Neil Bibby. In the draft uh, budget document, the Scottish Government state that they will constrain payments under the concessionary travel scheme as a result of a negotiated settlement with the bus sector. Yet the bus, bus industry body say that the budget for concessionary travel appears markedly below the current projected cost for the scheme. Can the Minister therefore confirm whether a negotiated settlement with the bus industry has been reached or not? Minister. There was a very positive meeting uh, with the bus injury industry yesterday. There are still continued discussions going on, but I thought the member might have, in his answer, welcomed the fact that we've promised, and Derek Mackay promised, 
to extend the concessionary travel scheme to modern apprentices and of course to those with a job grant for three months aged between 16 to 24. Uh, that was missing from his answer. I'm sure it was just a, uh, an, an accidental uh, omission on his behalf. But in terms of the concessionary travel scheme, uh, the, the Cabinet Secretary and indeed again uh, the, the, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance himself said that there will be a consultation to ensure that we have uh, long-term sustainability. So discussions are going well with the bus operators uh, and once we come to a conclusion I'm sure uh, he will be made well aware of that. Question five has not been lodged. Question six, Claire Baker. Um, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government when it last discussed transport issues in Fife with ScotRail. Minister. Uh, my officials discussed transport issues in Fife with ScotRail last week on the 13th of December uh, 2016. The meeting covers ScotRail's progress with delivering the initiatives uh, as outlined in the Performance uh, Improvement Plan. I also met with Shirley Ann Somerville, MSP, and Douglas M uh, Chapman, MP, earlier this month to discuss West Fife rail issues. Claire Baker. Um, first, can I thank the Minister for agreeing to my request for a rail infrastructure consultation event to take place in Fife. I'm sure there will be much interest. Um, Presiding Officer, this month I have been continually contacted by constituents travelling between Edinburgh and Fife raising complaints about delays, cancellations and capacity. This has included people being stranded at stations because of limited stops, often with families and young children, only two carriages on at rush hour, as well as peak hour cancellations, not inspiring much festive spirit in Fife. Uh, Minister, Fife passages are being shortchanged. Can you give us any assurances that as we enter the busy Christmas and New Year period, the train service for Fife will be able to meet passenger, passenger demand? Minister. I think as I've said repeatedly, both in this chamber and indeed in the public outside of this chamber, that real performance is not at the acceptable level that I would want it to be at. Uh, and, and, and again, in trying to be constructive, I would note at the end of period nine, which was the last railway period that just passed, the Fife route, the performance was 90 0.5, which is higher than uh, the franchise as a whole and over 2% higher than the GB average. Now, it's not at the level I want it to be, and I continue to say that. Uh, in terms of skip-stopping, again, she'll have noticed the, uh, the, the announcement from Phil Vester last month that in the peak times they're looking to reduce that. We want them to keep going further, so I recognise uh, what she says. In terms of uh, fares, uh, they've been mentioned to me by Fife Council uh, and indeed by, by commuters uh, in Fife, and I'm pleased to say with the discounts that we announced Last week, for example, those travelling from Mark Inch to Edinburgh uh, under our plans will save £78.50 if they're on a monthly uh, season ticket and indeed the same amount on an annual season ticket. Of course, if the rail fares were frozen, as she'd asked, it would only be a £63 saving. So they are, going, they are getting a considerable saving uh, from the discounts that we've mentioned. Uh, but of course, um, I want to see an improvement in services. I want to see an improvement in performance. I want to see an improvement across the railways. Uh, and I think she articulates the points uh, and the frustrations that passengers feel. But I'm committed to get, seeing that improvement. And we are seeing that improvement. And I'll continue to monitor improvement uh, uh, as the time goes on. That brings us to an end of uh, topical questions.